Hi, we are Caroline and Levi Holt, and we're part of the family here at Holt Farms. When I think of the people that I know that I watched wear Liberty overalls growing up, hard work, determination, perseverance, just a real appreciation for their craft and what they did and, and for things that, that lasted and for things that, that meant something to them. That's what I saw walking around in Liberty overalls. Shop LibertyBibs.com for your pair today. Hi, I'm Caitlin Dubin, and this is the Rural Woman Podcast. I'm a first-generation farmer who married into agriculture. Born and raised in a city, I was so unfamiliar with where my food came from, but I was determined to figure it out. Through my journey into agriculture, I saw women who were strong, but humble, often taking a back seat. To me, these women were leaders who deserved a seat at the table. I created the Rural Woman Podcast to share the voices of women in an industry whose stories often went untold. The rural entrepreneurs who live and breathe their work, full of grit and pride. We come here to share our stories, to be in community with each other, to be challenged and inspired, but most importantly, to be celebrated and to be heard. We may not all live, farm, ranch or homestead the same, but we are all connected. We are rural women and our stories are worthy of being told. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Rural Woman Podcast. Today you'll meet Sierra Seidner. Sierra is the owner of Iron Horse Animal Health Products, a company that manufactures high-quality but affordable supplements and feed for horses and livestock like chickens, sheep, and cows. She graduated from Westminster College with a degree in financial economics in December of 2018, but after taking her first accounting job, she knew that it wasn't the right career path for her. In July 2021, she had the opportunity to purchase Iron Horse, an established company that had been in business since 1967 from the founder, Dr. David Sweeney, and left her office job to pursue the more fitting and exciting lifestyle of being an entrepreneur. Along with running Iron Horse, Sierra also enjoys training and racing standard bred harness racing horses. Before we get to today's episode with Sierra, I just want to welcome our newest member of the Patreon community, Ilona, all the way from the UK. Thank you so much for joining the Patreon community and supporting the stories of women in agriculture to be shared through this show. Now, if you've been listening to the Rural Women podcast and you find meaning and value in the work that we're doing here and have the means to do so, I would love to welcome you to the Patreon community. So if you would like to learn more about how you can support the show financially, you can head on over to wildrosefarmer.com and look at how you can become a member of Patreon for the show. Without further ado, my friends, let's get to this week's episode with Sierra. Sierra, welcome to the Rural Woman Podcast. How are you? Hi, Caitlin. I'm great. I'm excited to be here. I've never done a podcast before, so this is uh, pretty exciting and new to me. Well, I'm excited that I'm your first podcast, hopefully not the last. And uh, (laughs) the folks listening, if you have a podcast, Sierra would like to talk to you too. So, (laughs) but I am the first. So we'll always remember this as our first. (laughs) Yeah, it'll be a very special moment. I'll remember forever. (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) Sierra, for the folks who are unfamiliar with you, give us your background, who you are, and how you got your start in agriculture. Okay, so I'm Sierra Seidner, and I actually grew up in town. Uh, My mom lived in town, and we went to a small high school, but I spent a lot of time on my great-grandparents' farm. Uh, She traveled a lot for work. She was in sales and everything, and they had 30 acres, and they had horses, so that's kind of where I fell in love with horses and everything like that, and uh like I said, great grandparents. And I was pretty much glued to my grandpa. So he's really the one who uh, taught me the value of hard work and everything like that. When I was 15, I got a job about 10 minutes from there. 
at a produce farm and a feed store. And what I did was I sorted sweet corn. So to sort the sweet corn, you would have to get there at like three or four in the morning. And I was 15. So <laughs> I didn't have a driver's license. My grandpa would actually get up every morning and he would take me to work. So God bless him for doing that. And then I did that for two more summers, seven days a week. And thankfully the next two summers I could drive. So I didn't have to get grandpa to take me out there, but he would still get up every single day. He'd ask me like the night before, Hey, when are you going to work? I'd be like, Oh, I got to be there at three. He'd be up at two 30, like making sure I was up and I had breakfast and everything and I was ready to go. <laughs> so I did that. I think it, I was 17 the last year I did that. It would have been coming up on my junior year of high school. And then when I got into junior year of high school, since they all had horses and I had really loved the horses at the farm, my grandma had said like, oh, you need to go meet Dr. Sweeney. He's got harness racing horses, the standard breads, and she called them sulky horses. But she's like, you need to go and meet him and, you know, find out what that's all about. So she took me over there and it was pretty much, I uh, jogged his one horse green card and <laughs> it was, I dove head first into the harness racing pretty quickly after that. It was my summer between my junior and senior year of high school, I had got my license. So I was able to compete at the county fairs and drive. I really liked that. And I was pretty much willing to drive any horse that he had. Although now I'm a little bit more selective because I've learned and that me being 120 pounds, I can't exactly slow down one of these thousand pound horses like a bigger guy can, but I still really enjoy it. And then from there, I went on to college after I graduated high school, Westminster for finance and accounting. And it was nice because the college was like five minutes from Doc's farm. So the whole time I was going through college, I was able to, you know, still work with the horses and everything like that. It was convenient and it's pretty much the way I made extra cash and everything. And just like, it was really nice because I scheduled my classes the first two years of college to only have class three days a week. So I would go like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday, I'd have time to basically hang out with the horses all day when I wasn't studying or things like that. And then even like the days I did have school, I was done by three or four o'clock. So it being that close, I could go to the barn. So that's really what I loved. And I graduated December, 2018. And after that, I went into some accounting jobs and things like that. And, you know, I was really good at accounting and everything like that. Like all my bosses, they were pretty impressed with my work and going through college. I got good grades and everything like that, but it was pretty much, I knew it wasn't the thing for me to do. It's just something about being trapped in an office all day long. After my whole life, I was outside on the farm working, you know, things like that. I just, I really, really didn't like it, you know? And like I said, it wasn't necessarily the work that I didn't like. It was just being trapped inside all day. That wasn't me. So um, me and my husband, we uh, got married in November of 2020. And I think it was shortly after that, I kind of said to him, I said, Ben, look, you know, I uh, really need to find something else to do that's more me. Um, I don't really enjoy doing this and I don't know how much longer I'll be able to last. And it would was the next December, so December 2020, Dr. Sweeney, who had help with his horses, he had this company, Iron Horse, and it's a uh, supplement, like a nutritional and feed company for equine and livestock animals. And he's 85 now, so he was 83 at the time, and he was kind of looking for somebody to take over it because he doesn't have any kids himself. So we approached him and asked, you know, hey, could we buy this and take over for you? And fast forward to July 2021, we became the owners and I've been doing that ever since. That is such a fun story that, you know, I think there's a lot of things that I can relate to within your story and we're going to dive into those. But uh, it's so great to look back and, you know, the love of horses that you had and, you know, being able to spend that time with your grandparents and on their farm. And now it's your job. So that's kind of like, I think that's what they would call the horse girl's dream is uh, <laughs> going from being with the horses as a kid to being, this is your full-time gig now, is all horse everything. 
<laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm uh, very lucky in that sense. And I'm a, I'm a pretty driven person. So from a young age, I knew it was pretty much, I was going to stick with horses my whole life in some fashion. Of course, you know, you don't know what that is at the time, but I thought it would be the race horses more full time, the harness racing, but it ended up um, actually running a supplement company for horses. Yeah, that is so, so good. So Talk to me about the conversation that you had with Ben, your husband, letting him know that what you were doing was not what you were meant to be doing or what you wanted to be doing. I know there are people listening to this and there are conversations that I've had one-on-one with people as well. They, they've they gone to school, they've got their degree, they are in a career, they probably have a salary and a pension and all of these wonderful things but they're going to work every day and they're knowing that this isn't what they're meant to be doing. How did that conversation go with Ben uh, sharing that you didn't want to be doing this anymore? Well, I don't think it was any sort of surprise for him knowing me, you know, because at the time, December 2020, I was working at the Youngstown Airport for Winter Aviation. I was an accountant there. And that was actually pretty cool, you know, because we'd be right on the runway. So we'd see all the planes and everything. And they did maintenance on a lot of cool planes that I got to like see in and everything like that. So there was a little bit more freedom with that job than some of the other, another accounting job that I did. But it it was just, he knew because I would go to work and then like, as soon as I got off work, I'd rush to the barn, you know, got to go jog, jog horses and clean stalls and stuff like that. And so, so that part, it was probably not a surprise for him, but when we actually had the conversation, it was kind of more or less like, okay, well, what do you want to do if you don't want to do this? It's like a lot of people in harness racing, they do it full time. So that is their job, but I'm a very risk adverse person. (laughs) So I like to do it as a hobby, but for me to make that my full-time income was not in in my mind, a a good idea. And then Dr. Sweeney, who, like I said, it's coming up on a decade. I've been working with him and the company. So kind of, I think it was always maybe in the back of our mind that we could possibly take it over, but we weren't completely sure when any of that would happen uh, because I was young when I first started working with him. And then I was not too long after that, I had met my husband. So, you know, it was kind of always in our mind, like, Hey, you know, if the opportunity ever comes up, we'd, we'd like to do this. And then it just ended up with me uh, getting the guts to more or less approach doc. Like, Hey, do you, do you really want to sell this? Cause I'm really interested in taking this over. So yeah, about how it went. One more question about Ben. Did he know anything or have anything to do with horses before he met you? No, the poor guy. He had no- <laughs> he had nothing to do with agriculture or horses or really anything like that. So it's been a wild ride and a, a learning experience for him. So he's I've got a lifetime knowledge of horses and then he's just thrown into harness racing and I'm pretty much the one who takes care of the business. I'm the one who does it full time. He helps sometimes. But it's difficult for him to know because somebody comes up to you and asks like, oh, I got a horse with a navicular. What should I do for this? Is there anything you can you have to give them for that? And he'll just like, what? what's navicular? <laughs> so that's kind of where I have to take over because right. he's definitely a lot better salesman than me. But as far as the knowledge of horses and, you know, livestock in general, because we have a wide variety of products, I'm the one with all that knowledge. Yeah, that's great. And that's when he gets to say, I don't know the answer, but let me get you in contact with my wife who does know the answer. (laughs) Yes. Oh, that's so great. So tell us more about Iron Horse. It it's a company that's been around for a very long time. And to get that and to have all of that knowledge under your belt, like it is a great fit for you to have. So tell us more about Iron Horse and the different supplements and everything that you have available. Yeah. uh, Like I said, it's been around for a while. Uh, Dr. Sweeney had started it in 1967. It was shortly after he got out of vet school. And the way he started it was he was looking at some of the other products and he was just basically like, well, I can make something better and more affordable than what these people are selling. So that's kind of like he how he got his start. But um, as I was mentioning, we have a broad, we cast a pretty broad net of products. So, you know, we're iron horse. So obviously horses are our big focus, but you know, we have stuff for sheep, chickens, cows, hoof and sole is our best seller. Uh, that's for horses with hoof issues. So it'll help thicken the hoof walls if they have thin soles, things like that. And then like our all purpose mineral, that's uh, something that people really feed the cows. 
So if they mix their own feed, then it comes in a 50 pound bag. So you just stick a 50 pound bag right in a ton batch of feed. And that's uh, for the dairy farmers. It's been a good thing because it's shown to increase the uh, milk fat by like 10%. So a big increase in your milk fat there when you're making cheese, that's pretty important. And then, like I mentioned, we have stuff for sheep. So we have the KAO. It's a vitamin trace supplement. So it's a just basically a mineral conditioner for sheep and goats. And it doesn't have copper because they're copper sensitive animals. And then a newest thing that we started over the summer was egg enhancer. So this is for chickens, uh, laying chickens specifically. They, uh, especially this time of year, the chickens like to go on strike and don't want to lay because it gets colder and they molt and everything. So this kind of helps. It boosts their vitamin intake to uh, help with the egg production. So you'll see an increase in egg production. And then you'll also see an increase in like the egg size as well by about 7%. And a funny story on the egg enhancer, when we were testing it for a while, my, our friend and realtor, she has ostriches. So I was like, hey, you know, people are really seeing a good uh, results with this with their chickens. Why don't you try it on Aggie and see what happens to her ostrich eggs? So she tried it and like after about a month, her ostrich eggs gained like half a pound. So it was, it was pretty incredible. And so ostriches, they have a specific laying season, I guess. And I didn't know this, but they lay from like April to September ish. And here in November, Aggie is still laying, getting the egg enhancer supplement. So that's, that's pretty cool. The ostrich story is like my favorite of all time. Yeah. So, but, and then getting back more into the agricultural part of the company, we do work with a lot of local co-ops, local farmers and feed mills and stuff that get some of our products. So we manufacture some, and then a lot of it is sourced out to other people who take our formulas and mix it for us. And when we took over everything they had, they basically sourced out to somebody else and uh, they would repackage a lot of it, or they would just sell it as it came. And me being the accountant finance person, I kind of looked at all of this and I was like, You know, I feel like since they've been with, Provini was doing it at the time and they're owned by Cargill and Cargill is like the biggest privately owned company in the U.S. It might be the world. They own Neutrina and Purina. So they're huge players in the animal feed industry. But I was looking at everything and I was like, you know, there's got to be some people who can do it at a better cost. And them being a big company, I don't think that you get that great quality either because, you know, when you're a single person company, you care more about that company than anybody else. If you have, you know, 200 employees, I mean, they're not saying that the employees aren't good or anything like that, but they're not going to care as much as the owners are about putting that quality into their products. So I did a lot of searching and I found some great local smaller businesses that now do a lot of our stuff. The prices are more affordable. The uh, um, the quality, I think, has increased quite a bit. So that's been a huge win. And then we've also pulled more things in-house to manufacture ourselves. So like I said, quality is number one for me. And I take really good pride in making sure all of our stuff is made well. So it's been a big win for me to be actually able to see what's going into the ingredients that they're what the best that they can be, essentially, when I'm mixing these supplements and funny thing more on the quality for that is when we first switched over so one of our supplements is an equine conditioner it comes in 25 pound bags well i kind of knew with a short time frame it was going to be coming in uh paper bags and i was like well we can't do paper bags because of the storage issues and things like this because people use it you know it's got to be stored for six months so we took our laminated bags and we basically rebagged every single one of these bags before we would sell it it was a it was a very labor intensive process, but like I said, I'm, I'm a big person who's really into making sure all the quality is right. So it was just, even though it took so much time and so much labor to rebag everything and we have a bag sewing machine. So you take the little, after you rebag it, you got to take the sewing machine and sew every single bag shut again, um, you know, hundreds, hundreds of bags, not just a couple. So <laughs> we did that and it was People were impressed with the new bags. They really liked them. And so that was a, it was a good win that we did that instead of like, oh yeah, here's some paper bags. They won't be like this forever, but just deal with it for now. So I didn't think that was the best way to go. And then as far as more of our business, getting our products to the customers, I'm on the road a ton. 
So Ben, he still works full time. He actually works from home. So that's pretty cool. So he doesn't have to travel and can help me more than he would if he had to like go to the office every day. But like 80% of our customers are Amish. And when we start started with the company, you know, they had basically delivered everything, you know, to everyone. And it's a very uh, time intensive procedure uh, to be able to do this. Um, and I'm not sure if they just thought that people wouldn't pay for delivery uh, to get it on a semi or if they just wanted to interact with people more, which, you know, is good to see and interact with your customers some. But when you're one person, it's really hard to be on the road that much and be able to keep up with the business, just the administrative tasks and then actually manufacturing everything. So I'm I'm on the road a lot, going to different trade shows and deliveries. Like I said, we scaled down some of our deliveries now and started mailing as much as we can. And there's some customers we'll always deliver to, but just going forward, I think we're going to scale that part of it down. I always find it really interesting, specifically for folks who, you know, think specifically in agriculture, we, we've talked about this, that there's not really jobs out there for them because they don't have land or they don't have a tractor or they don't have these things. But you are living proof that there are so many opportunities in agriculture for folks who don't have the land, who don't have the equipment, either to, you know, buy up an agriculture company like you did or start something on their own. And I like when you mentioned that, you know, you were thinking in your accountant mind that there's better ways of doing these things. Folks who have like driven tractors and been on the land their entire lives sometimes lack that knowledge or that part of their brain thinking like, how can I do this differently? How can I make this better? And you obviously are, you know, you're still learning and you're still improving all of these things to do them differently. But again, with the knowledge that you want to give your customers the best experience that they have. And, you know, it's a representation of you because it's your company. Yeah, definitely. So it's, uh, <laughs> like I said, it's it's definitely a lot of work, but I want our company represented the best way uh, possible. And like I said, when we took over, Dr. Slaney was in his 80s and his business partner was in his 80s. So it had kind of gotten to the point where they just didn't care as much. So that was a big thing for us too, is improving uh, the customer service as well, because they, I said that they delivered everything. So they would be just slow to get to the delivery, slow to respond, things like that, which, you know, <laughs> they were older. So, you know, that's to be expected, but uh, it was kind of one of the things when we took over, I was just like, you know, we got to step up our game here and uh, do these things better. And it's always good to know, I think when you have specific things to know to do better that you can work on rather than just uh, like, oh, I'm perfect and I can't ever do anything better. <laughs> right. Yeah. Constructive feedback is great because it helps you and it helps your company and all of the things. So. Agriculture is changing fast with tighter regulations, higher input costs, thinner margins, and constantly evolving technology and practices, it's not easy to keep up. There have been huge advantages in our ability to access knowledge, yet we're spending more time than ever hunting for the right information. Farmers spend on average 19% of their time seeking information. The knowledge farmers need to stay ahead of the curve is out there, but that doesn't mean it's fast or easy to find. All the knowledge and expertise in the world can't help farmers keep up with changes unless they can find it fast. And getting from question to answer quickly is make or break for the future of farming. The next great revolution in agriculture is finding the right information from the right expert at the right time. And AgVisor Pro is jumpstarting that revolution. AgVisor Pro has an independent network of some of the best professionals in agriculture. Their app taps into the network in a way that gets farmers the information, services, and expertise they need faster than ever before. Meet the future of farming head-on with AgVisor Pro. The AgVisor Pro app is available on iOS and Android. Head to the link in the show notes to download the AgVisor Pro app today.
Dara, what do you think have been some of the biggest challenges that you've faced as a new business owner? Oh, this is so to first start off, like I didn't get a ton of training on any of this stuff. I had gotten basically like, oh, here's how you make it. Here's what we do. Here's your contacts. Have at it. So <laughs> I, I pretty much went into this blind. And of course, I had been around Doc for a while, so I knew more about I had more like background information on the company. So even though I wasn't working there all the time, I did have some of that insight, but you know, it's difficult just going into a company blind like that and taking over and trying to know what to do and, you know, how to interact with certain people. And that was a big challenge. And it still is, like I mentioned before, Amish are 80% of our customers and the Amish are great and they're amazing to like watch because they have just such these old school techniques of doing everything, like plowing a whole field with like a six horse draft team. I mean, that's amazing to watch. And our, the neighbors at our shop there, actually, they have their phone in our building and their freezer in their building because they don't have electric. So they're, they're really good neighbors and they're pretty cool and would help you any way you can. But taking over for these 80 some year old guys and then trying to accommodate the Amish people because they don't look at women the same way that we do. Most of them, you know, the women, they're homemakers. So when they get married, they have kids and, you know, they might clean houses on the side or have a little bake stand, but that's all they do. So the women are not running businesses like I am. So I think at first, especially it was a shock to some of these Amish guys where I'd roll up in this big giant box truck with, with two tons of supplements on the back to deliver it. And they'd be like, who who are you? Are you the delivery girl? I said, no, we just bought the company. (laughs) So, you know, that was, uh, and, and most of them are pretty good about it, but I think it was just the initial shock of some of these guys that I was taking over and doing this. And it was funny because like, if we give some of them our business cards, like mine and Ben's business cards, they always want to call Ben. They always want to talk to Ben. They don't ever want to call me. And like, like I said before, he has no idea about horses. He's getting better and he knows, but like, if you're asking him specific problems, like, oh, my horse has OCDs, like you got anything for that? Like he's, he's going to have no clue. (laughs) So for like these Amish guys to specifically like call him and ask him this stuff, because that's how they think when you do business deals, you deal with the men it's been kind of a more difficult thing to make them understand. But like I said, our bigger customers and things, they, they've been really great with working for me. I think it was just more or less the initial shock of dealing with me. And then, like I said, another difficulty is that I'm pretty much doing everything myself. So I'm traveling all the time. We went to a trade show in Massachusetts a couple of weeks ago. So it was like a 10 hour drive hauling all the way out there by myself and setting up. And then I'm there for four days. And then you get done at five o'clock on a Sunday and have to drive home. And I got home at like four in the morning. <laughs> so there's a lot of long days that I put in. And it's not that Ben can't help me some. It's just he's got a full-time job. So, you know, nine to five, he's stuck at his computer doing everything rather than, you know, it's just the business parts of that or on my shoulders to be able to do the deliveries and manufacturing and everything like that. Yeah. And it's a lot, like it's a lot of work. And like you said, when you're out on the road, you're not able to be at home in your office or in your office doing the administrative tasks and the marketing and all of the other things on top of, you know, what you already do. So I want to flip that question now and ask you, what are some of the biggest wins that you want to celebrate as a new business owner? I think like some of the biggest wins that we have just in general are uh, people loving our products. So, you know, I mentioned that we're big sticklers on the quality. Uh, We also try to make things affordable as possible and we can do that because it's just, it's just me. And, you know, I hadn't the first year I didn't take a salary. I actually was still working part-time as an accountant. We didn't want to, you know, drain the blood out of the company, trying to get it to grow and everything like that. So that helps in us being able to keep our prices affordable and the hoof and soul specific specifically is our uh, biggest seller and people see so many great results with that. It's just like awesome when I go to these trade shows and people see me be like, oh my gosh, you have hoof and soul. Like, I love that. Like my horse had like all these problems and we tried for eight months, like all these different things and couldn't get any, any results. And then we tried your product for four months and you know, now their shoes are staying on their feet are so much better. It's like, that's, that's like what I live for is to make a difference in people's lives 
and see that our products actually work and are beneficial to people. So, yeah, those are so good. And those are such feel good moments for you after, you know, the long hauls and all of these things. Like when you see these people and they say it actually works and it helped, like, it's like, okay, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's good reassurance to know, like it's, not for nothing that all these long hours and everything they're really paying off. Yeah. So a question that I have for you, and it's a question that I'm often asked myself, but I always love the perspective of others and to see if, you know, my perspective is similar to other women who have done this before. But what advice do you have for someone who's listening that has thought about leaving their career to pursue something that is more them and is more suited to their lifestyle, their happiness, what have you, what is your advice for them? So like my advice would be to definitely explore the things that you would want to do. Otherwise your passion, you know, things like that. But right away, if you're relying on your income, just don't quit and dive in head first. Cause like I said, the first year we did this, I was still working part-time as an accountant to not drain the lifeblood out of the company. So you have to have more of like a stage transfer, I guess is the best way to call it, transition into going from your regular job now into doing something else full-time because I don't think success happens for anybody usually overnight. It's a gradual, it's a gradual thing. So like I said, it's just, you got to make it a, a smooth and just take your time with the transition. I know people get anxious and everything like that. Like, oh, I can't stand this. Like, I, I want to leave right now. I need to do something else. But, you know, don't get ahead of yourself and sink yourself at the same time. Because when you're trying to start a business, it you, you need capital, you need money to be able to do it properly. And I think just putting that time into your other job longer than you really wanted to will pay off in the long run when you're trying to get started. I have a tweetable moment here from you. Success doesn't happen overnight. It's a gradual thing. And that is, you know, as impatient as some people can be, including myself, like when I hear that, I'm like, I don't want that. Like, I want it like overnight. I want the instant gratification of my decision to quit my job to do whatever it was. But very similar to me, like I, you know, I didn't take that advice of having a plan afterwards and I figured it out after and it worked out for me, you know, it's working out now, but uh, yeah, it's very scary. But, you know, having, you know, and I think having the support behind you to make these big decisions in your life really helps too, to have a supportive partner or family or friends. I'm sure there was people that thought like, what the heck are you doing? But, you know, (laughs) do it anyways, I guess. (laughs) The people who support you will support you. And then the people who question like, what the heck are you doing? Like, I love proving them like, well, look what I did. Like, look what we're doing now. So (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's kind of uh, uh, my personality. My, my husband says I'm a very uh, vengeful person in that (laughs) respect. So if somebody tells me that I can't do something, I'm going to go way out of my way to prove to them that I can do it. Right. So, um, <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So what is next for Iron Horse? What's next for your company? We definitely have some exciting plans. So right now we're running our like shop warehouse facility. It's about a 2000 square foot building and it's in New Wilmington near Doc's Horse Barn and everything like that. But that's about because we live in Ohio and that's over in Pennsylvania. It's about a 25 minute drive to get there every day. And we recently in April just bought this property that we're on. It has 17 acres. So we're looking to actually, hopefully in the spring, starting to build a shop here. That way it just takes a lot of the pressure off to not have to go out there every day. And that'll allow Ben to be able to help me more and everything like that. And, you know, it's just like you look at it and the money you pay for rent and everything. And, you know, you can finance something uh, yourself and have it to be your own and actually own it and not lose the equity. So it just makes a heck of a lot more sense to, if you can afford it, to just build your own and do that. And of course, you know, we, it'll be a process because we have to look into the township zoning and everything like that. We're zone agriculture. So it should, that part shouldn't be an issue building it, but our road, we're not sure what the issues are going to be with semis coming down it to deliver our stuff. So that's going to be a a big process in the making to go to these township meetings. And most of them are going to be accepting of a new business to come to town. Definitely. But it's still just going to be a a long road ahead to do that. And then, you know, we also want to 
launch more products because we think there's a lot of uh, room in our product line to grow as well. We get a lot of requests for different things from existing customers and then just kind of moving more of the manufacturing back to ourselves. I know I said that we did some of it and we really want to do more, like I said, mainly to have a hand on the quality. So like right now when we do some of our mixes, the conditioners, they have so many different vitamins and everything in there. And to run like a one ton batch, you're only putting like a third of a ton of vitamin A in it. And like a whole 50 pound bag of vitamin A costs like $2,000. So when you're putting a third of a pound in a whole one ton batch and you know, you're selling 12 tons of this product a year, it's not very, it's just not very cost. I don't want to say cost effective, but it's smart to buy all this stuff because it's going to go, it, it's vitamins, they break down over time. So it's not going to keep its potency to be able to, you know, a year from now, it's going to be weaker and then people aren't going to be seeing the results that they're doing. So we're hoping as business grows more that we sell more of these products that it makes more sense to manufacture ourselves. Well, that is so exciting. And those are big plans for you and your company. And, you know, I I can't wait to follow along and see what happens. Sierra, where can folks learn more about Iron Horse? And the big question is, do you ship your products to people who are not in Ohio? Yeah, yeah. We have a website that we ship pretty much everything that they can order online. The uh, bigger stuff that comes in the 25, the 50 pound bags, they would have to contact us directly to get that. But um, harnessironhorse.com, that's our website and you can order and we're pretty fast with shipping within three shipping days. Usually though, I can ship it out next day, no problem. But sometimes when I'm on the road and traveling and stuff, it gets to be a couple days before it gets out. Okay. I want to learn more about harness racing and what it is because I had to Google it to know if I knew what it meant. So tell us more (laughs) about harness racing and your passion for this sport. So uh, harness racing, it's, it's awesome. And I love it, first of all, because most people are familiar to the thoroughbred racing, like the Kentucky Derby stuff where you're actually sitting on the horse and racing. This, you're sitting behind the horse in what's called a sulky. So it's like a two-wheeled cart that you drive the horse. And it's really nice because everybody can do everything. So you can be the owner, the trainer, and the driver on the horse. So when you're doing the thoroughbred racing, like the jockeys, they can't own the horses and the trainers, they can't jockey the horses. And it's just so much more rewarding, I think, to be able to like do everything ourselves. So this year we had pretty much our best horse, Tim. And as of two weeks ago, he gets to relax for the rest of the winter. But um, he he's done extremely well for us. And for me to be able to uh, own him and be the trainer on him when he's getting those wins, it's awesome. And then his first win, I drove him at the Shenandoah County Fair. The bigger tracks, I tend not to drive the horses just because the guys there are so much better than me and and I've learned you know it's it's just not that you know it's kind of an ego and a pride thing to set aside like like I know I can do this but it's better for the horse if somebody else who's better than me can drive him and teach him something you know rather than me going out there um not the best and you know it kind of puts them behind in that sense and then you know the harness racing my Grandma was definitely my biggest supporter of that. (laughs) So she's the one who introduced me to Doc and pushed me to keep going with that. And I mean, every single time I saw her, she asked about the horses. Like, oh, what are they doing? Like, did you win today or something like that? And, you know, a horse on average probably only wins like three times a year. So it, (laughs) it would get kind of irritating after a certain point. Like, you know, you go over there like every single day, like, hey, did you win today? It's like, well, I'm not racing today, Grandma, but... (laughs) But, but she uh, had just passed away a year ago this November. So, you know, it's kind of like one of those things where I miss having her ask me constantly what the horses were doing and if they're winning and things like that. But, you know, it's I wouldn't have gotten into this without her. So I'm definitely very thankful. And then as far as harness racing goes, it's a very big industry like here in Ohio and over in Pennsylvania. I don't think people realize how big of an industry it is. Like, millions of dollars the economies that it pumps in between a lot of the farmers the local farmers like we're buying hay alfalfa you know the feed stores we're buying lots of feed because i mean you know my horse eats a 50 pound bag of feed in three days so he gets 
fed a lot and it's really, really a good thing for the local economies. And I think Ohio, Ohio and Pennsylvania are probably the two biggest states that are, uh, have a good, uh, following of harness racing and a good program that there's just so many people there who do it. So it's just, it's a really good thing. And I don't think people realize just how big of an impact it has on the local economies. Well, it's really neat. And like you said, there you, there's obviously a big following in in your area for it. I didn't know much about harness racing, so I definitely had to Google it before because I actually thought I knew about harness racing because if anybody's watched season five of The Crown, then you saw that Prince Philip was driving these horses, but he was doing carriage racing. So fun fact, the difference between carriage racing and harness racing is the number of wheels. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so you have less wheels than Prince Philip did. <laughs> yeah, we have we have two wheels. And it's funny because we call them, we call our sulkies we, between all of us for just, the, we call it a bike because it's got two wheels. So it's a bike. But people who like cycle and ride bicycles, they get like really confused. They're like, what do you mean it's a bike? I was yeah. like, well, it's got two wheels. It's a bike. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. And I just think like, it's just something different, right? Like it's, I've never talked to anybody who's done harness racing. So for folks who are more interested in learning about it, what are some good resources or suggestions that you have for for people to follow or for people to look up more about harness racing? Yeah, so the USTA, that's the United States Trotting Association, ustrotting.com. They have a great website, very educational. You know, you can go in there and you can look at the races. You can see every single race that's going on in the country the United States across all the different tracks that specific day. And I mean, you know, any given day, you probably got at least 10 tracks that are racing. So you can look up the results and everything like that. I think Trackmaster, I think is the website where you can pull up more in-depth information about the actual races and the horses and everything like that. So I'm not, everybody asks me all the time, but I don't bet. I, I, I've never bet on any of my horses. I think it's bad luck. So I just don't. So if you ask me anything about how to bet or anything like that, I have, I have no clue. I honestly don't. And I've been doing this for a decade. So, <laughs> but uh, I love that. yeah, but as far as just finding the information and stuff like that, the U S trotting association, and then for Ohio, they have the Ohio harness horsemen's association. I think that's O H H A dot com. Um, you can find a lot of good just resources about their their programs of, you know, if you want an Ohio bred horse or something like that. And then they give a lot of uh, a good breakdown and analysis of just how much harness racing impacts our local economies. And it's a very important thing. And harness racing in Ohio was almost dead up until I think it was like 10 years ago. Governor Kasich really pushed to help revive the harness racing program in Ohio. And now it's better than it ever has been. So extremely thankful for that. That's awesome. That's so great. Well, and I've list, I wrote all those down. So I'm going to list them in the show notes so people can find them and learn more about it and maybe start a new hobby and or career out of harness racing. (laughs) Yeah, there are some tracks up in Canada. I know uh, Mohawk races and I think I forget what the other one is. It's Windsor or something like that. There's, there's a couple of them up there in Ontario. I know that. So cool. Well, whatever Googling I do, I'm going to put them in the show notes. So if you're listening, (laughs) go to the show notes. It's all there. (laughs) Oh, that's so great. Sarah, it has been so wonderful chatting with you today. And the passion that you have for horses, I can hear in your voice. You love them. They are, like I said in the beginning, this is like the horse girl's dream of, you know, growing up with them and getting to love them in every stage, whether that's, you know, on a farm or if they're behind or pulling a harness for harness racing. So my last question for you is what is the most rewarding part about being a rural woman for you? So going back to like why I originally quit my job, I think it's the freedom that I get with doing this. People are going to listen to this and probably be like, well, what the heck do you mean freedom? Like I got to get up at four in the morning and milk my cows every day. But it's like, you know, it's a different kind of freedom because there's no boss sitting there at your door like, hey, I need this spreadsheet by four o'clock. Like this is literally like my own to make it what I want. And if I do something wrong, well, it's on me and I'll learn from that and I'll improve next time. If I do something right, then, you know, I'm still going to find ways to improve it and do it better. But like I said, it's just the freedom you get to literally make something your own and do what you want with it. Um, And I think that goes for any farm or anything like that, you know, there's always different things that you can do 
And you're always going to have the hard work, the day-to-day uh, chores that need to be done every single day. But then the rest of the time, I mean, it's yours to do what you want with it. Make it your own and do something great. Yeah, that's perfect. Do something great. I love it. <laughs> so good. Sierra, for the folks listening who would like to connect with you after the show, where can they find you online? Yeah, so you can find, I mentioned Iron Horse's website, harnessironhorse.com. We have a Facebook page. It's Iron Horse Animal Products. And then we have an Instagram as well. I think it's just at Iron Horse Products. And then if you want to connect with me on my personal pages, it's Sierra Seidner. So S-E-I-D-N-E-R is my last name. Perfect. And those links will be in the show notes too. So be sure to head to the show notes if you'd like to connect with Sierra and all of the good things that Iron Horse is doing. Thank you again so much, Sierra, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Awesome. I had a great time, Caitlin, and it was a great first podcast. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) Thanks for listening to the Rural Woman Podcast, a proud member of the Positively Farming Media Podcast Network. The Rural Woman Podcast is more than just a podcast. We are a community. A huge thank you to the Rural Woman Podcast team, audio editor Max Hofer, and admin support from Kim & Co. Online. A special thanks to our Patreon executive producers, Sarah Reedner from Happiness by the Acre and Carrie Munven from Laystone Farms. To learn how you can become a Patreon executive producer or other ways to financially support the show, head on over to wildrosefarmer.com to learn more be sure to hit the follow or subscribe button wherever you listen to the podcast to get the latest episodes directly on your playlist. And if you are loving the show, please be sure to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other platform that accepts ratings and reviews. You can connect with us on social media at The Rural Woman Podcast and with me at Wild Rose Farmer. One of the best ways you can support the show is by sharing it. Send this episode to a friend or share on your social media. Let's strengthen and amplify the voices of women in agriculture together. Until next time, my friend, keep sharing your story. There's a better way to answer on-farm questions with AgVisor Pro. Farmers are able to get answers now, not later, from an independent network of some of the best professionals in agriculture. Spend less time searching for those answers. Ask your question on the AgVisor Pro app and move faster and more confidently in your decision making. Available on iOS and Android, head to the link in the show notes to download the AgVisor Pro app today.